Hello and welcome to the Swan Song Project podcast. My name is Ben Buddy Slack and I'm the founder of the Swan Song Project and the host of this podcast. The Swan Song Project is a charity. We're based here in Leeds in England and we help people who are facing the end of their lives or dealing with a bereavement to write and record an original song. We believe in celebrating lives, making memories and leaving legacies. If you'd like to find out more about the charity, you can visit our website, which is swansongproject.co.uk. The podcast features songwriters. Every episode I have a different guest on, and I ask them to share with us one of their songs. We have a chat about how they wrote it. I ask them to share a songwriting tip, and I also ask them to share a song that's meaningful to them in some way related to bereavement. This episode features Andy McKee, who's one of the world's like finest acoustic guitar players, um, and it's a really fascinating conversation um, about how he writes his incredible guitar playing music. Um, so yeah, I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, so if you do enjoy the episode, please uh, like, share and subscribe to the podcast. We're trying to grow it. We've got a lot more fantastic guests lined up. Um, but yeah, without further ado, here's Andy McKee on the Swan Song Project podcast. Okay, today I'm here with Andy McKee. Thanks for joining me, Andy. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, so this is the Swan Song Project podcast. For anyone new to the podcast, um, we do it in three sections. First, we're going to have one of Andy's songs. Uh, and we'll have a bit of a chat about how he wrote that. Uh, in section two, I'll ask Andy for a songwriting tip. And in section three, we're going to talk about a song that's meaningful to Andy in some way relating to bereavement. Uh, so over to you, Andy. Which of your songs have you chosen to talk to us about today? Uh, well, I picked a, a tune called Hunter's Moon. And uh, I originally released Hunter's Moon... Uh, several years ago uh, as a solo guitar piece uh, on an album called Joyland. And uh, I originally came up with Hunter's Moon because I sort of wanted to revisit uh, revisit playing the guitar in a sort of percussive way. Um, I really haven't written too many tunes where I do a lot of percussion on the guitar, but uh, my career kind of took off uh, with a very sort of percussive guitar tune, uh, integrated percussive sort of guitar playing uh, called Drifting. And uh, so, you know, a lot of people discovered me with that song on YouTube when when YouTube came out, you know, I guess about 20 years ago almost now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, I, I've always kind of been interested in many facets of, of acoustic guitar playing, finger style guitar playing. Um, but I kind of became known with with that tune. So I thought, well, maybe I'll write another one, you know, and just, you know, show a, another example of that kind of way of playing. So uh, Hunter's Moon is uh, in an altered tuning and I, I play over the top of the neck. Uh, and do percussive stuff on the guitar body while playing. Uh, and so it incorporates some tapping on the fretboard and harmonics and things like that. Uh, and of course, this whole style for me was inspired by uh, Preston Reed originally. I don't know if your uh, viewers are familiar with him or not, but he's one of my first influences to get into the acoustic guitar. So um, so anyway, yeah, I just wanted to write another tune sort of in that style. But uh, the video we're going to have for everyone today is is a new take on Hunter's Moon. I've I've done a lot of touring over the years um, solo, but sometimes I, I get to have friends come out with me or uh, sometimes I'll hit the road with this project called Guitar Masters where I'll have a couple of other guitar players with me on the road. And uh, at the end of the night, we always play together and we'll usually take a song from each guitarist and the other two guys come up with parts to sort of accompany uh, the original tune. And so um, I've frequently done that sort of thing with my friends Callum Graham and Trevor Gordon Hall. And it had just come to the point where it was like, you know, we should really do an album someday. And so uh, we finally recorded that and uh, it'll be coming out in the spring of 2024 officially. We had some pre-order stuff and, and those people actually already have the album, but uh, it's, it's, it's called Triplicity. And so we have a take on Hunter's Moon where the three of us are playing and uh, Callum and Trevor added some really cool parts to it. Brilliant. So yeah, we'll hear that now. So this is the uh, the new version of Hunter's Moon by Triplicity.
Okay, brilliant. So that was yeah, Hunter's Moon, the triplicity version. Um, yeah, it's an amazing, amazing piece of music. Um, just yeah, <laughs> in so many ways. Um, <laughs> so yeah, before we get on to the triplicity side of it, um, I might just go back and asking you about some of the the start of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure um, some people listening to this might have heard uh, "Drifting" was your track that went like madly viral, didn't it? When uh, um, on YouTube and so bef- did you say was that one of the first ones you'd done where you had more of the percussive guitar on? Yeah, that's that's right. I, I actually wrote Drifting when I was about, I, I forget, I was either 19 or, or maybe 18 even. Um, and I had been playing electric guitar with friends, you know, in high school. And we had, uh, you know, little bands and stuff and things like that. But uh, I actually saw Preston Reed play at a guitar workshop when I was 16. And it was like, it just sort of re-scrambled my brain. I, I had no idea, uh, you know, that you could do that sort of thing with a steel string acoustic guitar. So um, I had tried learning his stuff by ear from the record and wasn't really getting anywhere. You know, I didn't know anything about altered tuning so much at that time. Uh, but uh, I got an instructional VHS cassette. That's how long ago this was. Uh, <laughs> that uh, he, had, uh, he had showed how to play a few of his tunes. So I you know, got some of the techniques and learned uh, a few of his pieces and then, you know, wanted to start creating my own too. And and so I think I was either 18 or 19 and I wrote Drifting uh, and tried to incorporate that sort of style with the percussion and tapping and altered tunings and stuff. Wow. And then, so then so that must have been strange to have like, you know, just, just exploring kind of new techniques and get used to them and then have that kind of level of attention to it. Did you then feel quite yeah. a lot of pressure to then kind of like, to maintain yeah. that style and keep developing it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had, uh, you know, I guess it, it had been a few years, you know, since I wrote it um, when when we uh, finally had videos on the internet on YouTube. Um, and and we shot a bunch of those videos just at uh, the guy that ran uh, Candy Rat Records. It was his, uh, his sort of studio um, space and just put them on there to see if we could get some new fans on uh, on there, you know, people that might like acoustic guitar, but it kind of went crossed over to just average, you know, people. They just never seen anyone play guitar that way, mm-hmm. uh, which was definitely a big part of it. It was like, what the heck? You know, and I looked kind of weird. I had a, uh, well, I almost looked like you, I guess, but you don't look <laughs> weird. I looked weird. <laughs> I, I, I look a bit weird. Yeah, I had, had much more of a beard. Actually, I just trimmed even my my stubble I usually have just the other day. But uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know they they were just kind of you know captivated by it I guess a bit with the way I looked and the way I was playing the guitar and just some of the comments were pretty pretty far out. But uh, <laughs> but but I you know I, I did feel like actually a, a real pressure to make sure everybody knew about you know Preston Reed and and Michael Hedges and all the guys that inspired me because mm. like I said I think this was the first time anybody had seen anybody play guitar that way and you know I didn't want to feel like I was taking all the credit for like some genius you know I came up with all of these techniques it's just I think a lot of people hadn't seen them before but um but uh, nonetheless you know yeah I, I felt like wow this is really taken off and Fortunately, I had a few other tunes, you know, uh, right behind it that, that people enjoyed too. You know, there was Ryland and For My Father, and and uh, not too much later we had Evan Coast and stuff. And um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's been crazy. It still feels like a dream when I wake up. Sometimes, you know, I can't believe I'm just from you know the middle of nowhere in Kansas in a way, you know, and to have people in uh, in Taiwan suddenly wanting you to come do a concert is like what in the world. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, it's, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> How big was the um this kind of finger style and like all the kind of this kind of style of playing? Because I know obviously and obviously it was um mutual friend John Gorm who put us in touch, who's you know, there's a lot of stuff with one song, um, who had a similar kind of thing to some extent, didn't he? If we're, you know, very viral. And it is something which like it's such a viral kind of thing, isn't it? For like people, as you say, because like, obviously the music's so uh so impressive but the visual of it's so impressive as well and for people who just haven't um haven't come across that kind of music before like the internet does work so well for engaging people with it what was the scene like before like before you know drifting went viral and things like that was how Mm. did you yeah that's a good question it's it feels like a whole other world sometimes you know um because uh when i got into this kind of music like i said initially it was 
going to a guitar workshop and 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 being really impressed with uh, Preston Reed's playing. Um, but uh, then I just kind of dove into buying, you know, CDs and, and uh, compilation albums that would take various guitar players. And I'd hear, uh, you know, Don Ross, actually, uh, he was on a compilation album that I, that I bought and became a huge influence for me. Same with Billy McLaughlin. Um, and that was kind of how I discovered this stuff. And, uh, you know, but but with um, with the stuff I found, the CDs, you know, uh, I I didn't know what it looked like you know, how they were playing or anything like that. But um, I was just really drawn to the music. And uh, it's funny, like, I, I, I've always had, like, a connection with instrumental music. The first uh, album I ever bought was the soundtrack to Rocky IV. Uh, and that was because, um, really, the instrumental music on that album, I was just so impressed with it. I was probably seven years old or something like that. Um, and there's like the training montage music or, uh, the, during the fight, there's a music called war and it's all instrumental music. And I just remember having this feeling like, I love this, you know, like why, why there's no words here, but I feel moved by the music, you know? And so, uh, instrumental music, I was just drawn to it and it's, it almost felt like some sort of magic, you know, to me and it mm -hmm. still does. And. And, uh, you know, why is it you can have such a strong feeling from music that doesn't even have words, it's not telling you anything, you know, with language, but, uh, or maybe what's not normally considered a language, but maybe music, you know, is a language and, and you, you have a feeling suddenly like a, a real sadness or a, a, like an energy, like you want to go do something, you know, you feel motivated by the music. Um, I, th I still think that's pretty powerful. And that's why I, kind of stick with instrumental music and my voice sucks but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was you know um how i would discover stuff before youtube and and there was actually a, a big international bluegrass festival uh here in kansas and they have uh, the international fingerstyle guitar championships are held there and so i would go to that you know and, and discover new players and and that was kind of the the way i found out about uh, a lot of the stuff in guitar magazines, I guess, too. Mm. Yeah, I guess. Well, after I asked that question, I was thinking, like, is this a silly question? So I guess like all genres of music, you know, obviously before the internet, people have ways of finding out about them. But I think one of the things that for the, well, I was thinking then, like, when you get a CD of like a fingerstyle player, was there any part of you that was like, I bet they're not all doing that at the same time? I bet, I bet that's like, oh, you know, <laughs> I think when you, <laughs> when, when you see like one of your videos, it's like, oh, well, he is doing all the percussion, he's doing all these different parts. There's something quite yeah. special about that, whereas, if I'd never seen it and I just heard a recording, I'd be like, oh, there's probably, you know, three or four people there doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool that you mentioned that too. And I might just kind of go off on a sidebar just a little bit uh, along those lines. Like I find myself more drawn to kind of reducing the theatrics of what I do uh, in more recent years. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or, or, or what exactly, but I'm trying to focus more on the music, actually. Um, I think sometimes maybe those theatrical things can get a little too too, too far, maybe, at least for my taste. Um, and so I, I, I find myself kind of turning away from it a little bit and trying to focus more on the expression of, of the music uh, and trying to really convey that as best I can rather than, uh, than kind of diving more into uh, the, the technical side, I guess, of doing difficult or complicated things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must be a um, difficult balance, I guess. Uh, particularly when you kind of like, you know, that's part of what people. I guess, I guess, some of the events you do, there's people there who are, and they really want to see all the technical stuff, and there's a balance mm -hmm. of like wanting to be able to, you know, display some of that, but then also just being like, oh, these are just the pieces of music that move me most, uh, regardless of how technical they are. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a little bit of a balance, you know. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, but I, 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 uh, I'll try to do what, what feels right to me at all times, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about Hunter's Moon a little bit. So what can you remember about um, the writing process of that when you first came up yeah. with it? Yeah, I, well, I, I wanted to, to do a percussive sort of guitar tune. And so, um, you know, actually just in general with, with uh, finger style guitar pieces, part of my process I guess is coming up with a new tuning or using one that I haven't tried before that I discover and uh and just kind of finding what I can do with it a bit you know what kind of chord voicings are possible 
And, uh, and so I, I have this sort of approach where I'm like a discoverer every time I'm trying to come up with a tune. There's something I like about that. Um, and some guitar players I've talked with, you know, they just think I'm insane. Like, why would you <laughs> mess with the tuning so much, you know, and like, <laughs> If I, if I know this chord, I know the sound I want to have, and this is the chord I want to do, boom, and they can do it instantly. And, and uh, you know, if you've got a weird tuning, you might not know exactly. you got to take a second, like, oh, okay, here I can grab the flattened seventh for that chord, and now I can play it. Um, and so I don't think, you know, using these altered tunings might be the best way to approach uh, jamming with other people, at least not for me. I, I usually go to standard tuning, but... Uh, when I'm coming up with new music, though, I like to experiment with the different tunings because it kind of leads me into new sounds, um, you know, new chord voicings and um, just, you know, possibilities that that are there that wouldn't be if you didn't change the tuning around. So mm -hmm. um, so anyway, with uh, Hunter's Moon, I, I started to go to a tuning uh, that I had used before, but I left uh, the D as the fourth string as a D rather than a E flat. And I had used that uh, it's, it's a C minor 11th chord. Uh, and so I, I decided just to leave the fourth string as a D. And, and so it goes C, G, D, uh, F, B flat, D. And so I just started there. And what, what I kind of like about some of these altered tunings that have the C, G, and D in the bass, you have uh, like a stacked fifths, I guess you could say, um, or a suspended second chord. So like you have the root and then the fifth and then the ninth. And so just by hammering on with like that over the top, if you were to just get the two high strings, you get a root and a fifth, and that's like a power chord on a mm -hmm. regular guitar. Uh, or if you want to get the ninth, which I just love the sound of ninths, you know, uh, you can hammer all three of those and you get uh, the sixth, fifth, and fourth strings covered all on one bar. So when you're playing over the top of the neck, you can just cap, like a capo, just cap it on like that. And then you've got, uh, either a power chord or a ninth chord uh, just right there. And so I, I started with that. And that's why I uh, actually left that uh, fourth string at a D rather than an E flat. So I could get that ninth chord. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I started. And I had this rhythmic idea. So that was kind of the rhythmic idea I wanted to get. Um, so it starts starts out with the uh, hammers and the percussive stuff, um, and that kind of gets your intro. And then I add in a kick drum sound uh, with the with the bass of my uh, right hand hitting the lower bow of the guitar. Um, and so this, in, in a similar way, like with drifting, uh, I started out with this kind of percussive rhythmic riff, guitar riff, you could say, you know. And uh, like if you were in a, a band playing the guitar, you you could rock out on your riff and then the, the vocals come in and then it keeps going. So like with Drifting and Hunter's Moon, it's like, well, I need to start getting a melodic idea in here. You can't just be sitting here doing chords and percussion and that's the it, you know. So uh, I decided to try to use the harmonics um, for melodic ideas. And uh, with that tuning, the C, G, D, F, B flat, D, you've got quite a few notes there um, at the harmonic nodes, either on the 12th fret or the seventh fret, um, or if you wanted to do 19 rather than, I actually do go up to 19 rather than to seven. It's the same node, uh, same harmonic. And so I was using harmonics on the 12th and uh, 19th frets to come up with little melodic passages that I could incorporate uh, while keeping that sort of rhythmic idea going too. Uh, and so that kind of gets you into the verse. Um, and then I guess what you could call the chorus, there's sort of a pre-chorus where it's uh, just sort of the hammer-ons and percussion. And then uh, when the chorus kind of kicks in, I, I extend the bar that I'm hammering on to include some of the higher strings. So I get some melodic, like almost like uh, harmonies, like uh, vocal harmonies. And that's the chorus that you hear come in slap harmonics and maybe i'm going too far here i don't know <laughs> that's <laughs> no, fascinating yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if all your listeners are guitar players or they're just like what <laughs> yeah this is, this is boring <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, but those that's kind of the main you know sketch of the tune and there's sort of a bridge section where i go into strumming 
Uh, and I like to get into that, like in drifting, I did as well. And, and some of my other tunes, when I'm arranging things, it's like, okay, I've been doing percussion and harmonics. How can I come up with a new texture, you know, for a new part? And so in the bridge section of Hunter's Moon, I go into strumming chords. Um, and uh, that's kind of that. And then it goes back into the earlier parts and kind of rounds out. But uh, I really love what Callum and Trevor added, though, to the track that, that we played here, too. Uh, I think, you know, we all try to be sensitive musicians, you know, and if we're, and I mean that like uh, sensitive to the other players, if you're playing with other people, uh, as well as probably sensitive people, you know, I guess that's how you can write music if you're in touch with the world a bit. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, we try to respect each other's core parts. And I think those guys, what they added, it just fits perfectly. And, and it adds color and, and helps define this imagery of sort of at nighttime outdoors, hunter's moon kind of vibe. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. And did the, <laughs> um, did the title come when, when you'd written it? Did it just like, did the title come and feel like that was what you felt like it was describing in a way? Or? Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it was something I had in my mind of some, something like nighttime, and to be honest, actually, what really locked in the title for me, um, I was uh, friends, uh, unfortunately, with a guitar player who passed away recently. Um, and uh, his name's Al Petaway. And uh, anyway, he was also a real, really great photographer. And I had seen a photograph he had taken of a hunter's moon, uh, really full sort of orangish moon. Uh, and I thought, that's the title right there. And so that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I'm always interested in with instrumental music, so because I've I generally always been someone who's like very lyrical, um, and I've, I've written some stuff where like I'm playing guitar and I'll come up with something and it has a feel to it, and then I'll try and write something to describe that kind of feeling. Um, so I'm always interested with instrumental music whether there's, and I feel like this is probably the say the equivalent of the question of what comes first, lyrics or music, <laughs> but for instrumental music, mm -hmm. um, whether it's you start with like, I want to write a song that conveys this kind of emotion or this kind of feeling. And then you start playing with that in mind or whether you start playing and then listen to it. And then it's you know, the other way around, I guess. You start playing, something comes out and you're like, that feels like this. Um, yeah, it's I get I get both of those sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. Like Hunter's Moon was more of a, a conscious decision to write like a percussive guitar tune. Um, and that was kind of where it came from. It wasn't necessarily a, uh, like I had this image of of a nighttime outdoors thing necessarily uh, at, at the start of it, but that was kind of the feeling I was getting from as I was playing and coming up with ideas melodically and, and things like that. But uh, but there's other tunes, though, where I did have a certain uh, image or uh, person or place in mind. And uh, maybe one good example of that would be like Into the Ocean, the tune I wrote on the harp guitar that um i wrote after seeing the pacific ocean for the first time and um being from kansas it made a real impression we're right here in the middle of the united states so uh i was you know you get that sort of humbled feeling when you see the ocean or or maybe a mountain you know and you just or when you look up at the night sky you know you just feel very small and and humbled in a way so the ocean kind of humbled me a bit and when i got home i just wanted to capture that um, as best I could and and uh, I think maybe in some way too though the tune was inspired a bit by uh, by like sailing by uh, Christopher Cross if if people are familiar with that um, the the sort of uh, guitar riff I guess in that I think it captures the ocean a bit uh, too and 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 so I think the the similar vibe is in into the ocean it's just kind of this rolling fluid sort of piece um and and so anyway yeah i was really trying to capture a, uh the ocean with that or um another tune just real quick it'd be like for my father i wrote for my dad you know when he was uh, uh terminally ill with cancer and so i wanted to just capture like a nostalgia kind of feeling and uh the warmth you know that you know you can the relationship you can have with your father so yeah it is amazing that how uh, how music can tell such a story and create such a uh, an image. Um, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions that came to mind as you were talking there. So one I was going to ask was, um, 
when you're the way you described writing Hunter's Moon, so having the one part and then like thinking, oh, I'm going to do the melody part now. Do you do you break do you separate the parts originally? So like you so you mentioned you wrote, wrote the percussive part and the main rhythm part, and then so then would you like write the melody just playing the melody bit and then stick them together to work out to play them together, or would you keep playing the the original part whilst you're add, adding the new part on? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, on Hunter's Moon, that was the uh, the second sort of option. There, I was I was trying to keep you know the rhythm, you know, originally just trying to keep feeling that rhythm as I was working on it, and then it's like, well, can I actually physically keep that going? And you know, or you know, what kind of things can I take away from the first part? but still maintain its identity, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then can I incorporate some little melodic ideas in here? Um, that was how Hunter's Moon came in. And so like the harmonic uh, uh, melodic ideas that I was doing, um, I was kind of fitting those in and they syncopate well with the rhythm. Uh, and, and, there, and so you can kind of do both at the same time, almost like a puzzle piece, they fit together. Um, uh, there was another one, though, on harp guitar I wrote called The Friend I Never Met, where I actually put the original idea on a loop station and then started to see if I could come up with a melody on top. And then mm -hmm. and then it was like, OK, can I put these together and found a way to make that work? So but on Hunter's Moon, yeah, I was trying to just do it all at once and see what could come together. Yeah, oh, that's really <laughs> interesting. And this might lead us nicely <laughs> on to talking about the triplicity stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. Are there ever times when you're writing stuff where, like, you know, where the technique is just too hard? Of like, there's, you know, in your head you can hear, I really want to do this part whilst I'm doing this part, but it's just like too difficult. Or is it sometimes you like hear it in your head of what you want to do, and then it takes a while to, you know, be able to get to get to the level where you can you can pull off a certain combination of yeah. parts. Yeah, yeah. There's there's been a couple of times. Um, where that's happened and um yeah and and really like just like when i'm learning like a new piece or or something you know from a from a guitarist that i admire and they're, they're doing something i don't understand it's i just i try to take it into really small chunks um you know maybe break it down to one measure or even just one beat or two beats and make like a little loop of that in my playing and just do those two beats over and over and over and over until I can uh, do what, what I want to do or what I need to do to be able to play the piece if it's somebody else's. Um, but if I'm, you know, trying to come up with a new thing and got to find a way to do it, I'll just kind of repeat it like that, you know. And uh, if it's a technique thing, too, I'll, I'll try to figure out ways uh, to make it work. Sometimes it's even just a matter of changing the tuning. Uh, let's say, uh, like I did an arrangement of... Um, Everybody Wants to Rule the World from uh, Tears for Fears. And uh, I had been using uh, the open D tuning to, to work on that, make the arrangement. But when I got to the sort of bridge section to that tune, I ran into uh, a problem. I just, I couldn't seem to figure out how am I gonna make this little thing work? This It's like uh, the part where there's a keyboard that goes like, dee, 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 dee. Dee, 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 like that and uh and then there's also the chords behind it and i'm like ah, i can't seem to find a way to make all this work and then i decided to change the tuning and uh put a b note because uh, i needed to get this b note and i just wasn't able to reach it and so I, I changed the second string from an a to a b and then i was able to play the b as a harmonic and then i was actually able to do the whole phrase as harmonics so like that, dee, 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 dee. those are all harmonics. And I was like, oh, and then I can just hold this bass note down and, <laughs> and then use these two fingers to do the harmonics. And there we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> just a matter of uh, problem solving a bit, I mm. guess, you know, maybe you got to be a little bit of a, an engineer or a scientist yeah. brain in there somewhere <laughs> to figure that stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> it must be very satisfying when you do that, when you get that. Oh, uh, yeah. Particularly one like that, where you're just trying to figure out how to do it and then it just clicks and yeah yeah exactly yeah. like you're like at a loss but it's, yeah it's like a revelation and you know like oh wow <laughs> this can actually work <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how quickly um how quickly does this field like evolve so like this is um 
and now you see, yeah, obviously, I kind of know John and you know, the music, and but I don't know a lot about this kind of um, this style of playing really. Um, and every time I see see like and you, so I always feel like, oh, I've not seen not seen them do that before. And um, but how quick like is the is the new techniques evolving all the time of uh, how people do these kind of things, or is it kind of like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah? I guess um, the uh... The, the one of the guys that really impressed me, like in the more recent years, uh, with his technique and stuff, uh, would be Pateri Sariola. He's a, a Finnish guitar player, um, and he's he does some really cool percussive stuff. But he has just his own kind of approach, and his way of doing like a snare drum is is so cool. I need to try to steal it. It's it's really really <laughs> awesome. But it's like he kind of hits the uh, you know the guitar strings kind of extend over the fretboard. Um, and let's say you're on an acoustic guitar and you've got like the body of the guitar and then the fretboard kind of continues a bit on top of the guitar body and you traditionally don't play it there just because it's so high, but, um, your strings are running across that bit of fretboard and he like slaps it and these guitar strings hit the fret wire and it just sounds so good. It's like a snare drum and, uh, and yeah, so I, I love his technique with that and then just his ability and songwriting and everything is really cool um but you know there's there's other players out there that are getting pretty wild too i guess well you know john uses uh, like banjo tuners that that was really cool to see mm -hmm. um I, I know adrian leg was another player or is another player excuse me um that that uh he i think he may have pioneered the banjo tuner thing and but you know john incorporated that as well with the percussive and and uh and all that and the tapping and uh, there's Alexander Misko out of Russia who's doing all those kind of things too. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on, I guess. Uh, um, yeah. But I don't know, I guess I haven't really dove into to the banjo tuners or, or other things. Um, uh, I guess I'm just trying to write the best music I can really actually the last thing I released that was a, uh, uh an album was synthesizer music so it didn't even have guitar on it so i'm just kind of <laughs> experimenting and trying different things just with even without a guitar these days a bit <laughs> yeah oh well <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah brilliant so for the triplicity stuff then so and you've got the new albums coming out with them early in the new year you said um yeah yeah it's going to be in the spring we were wanting to release it in the fall this year but it we had some stumbling uh blocks i guess uh this year unfortunately with a few things with management Ugh. but uh it'll eventually be coming out in the spring so <laughs> brilliant brilliant um so with that version of hunter's moon that we heard with the triplicity um were the parts what what the other guys uh, were playing were they things that you'd written or had in your head originally or were they parts that they came up to themselves to compliment hunter's moon Right. Yeah. So like on the entire album, um, you know, we've taken tunes from each guy and then the other guys at company. Um, and we do a Michael Hedges uh, tune as well on there. But um, what we wanted to do was just give each other the freedom to express, you know, be yourself on this on the track, mm -hmm. you know, and you go ahead and come up with it, you know, and if it was too far out, I guess we could say, hey, maybe you want to <laughs> reel that <laughs> in or something. But I don't think that even happened once, actually, to be honest, you know, uh, I don't think that happened at all. Uh, so yeah, we really just let everybody, you know, do their thing, and uh, it came together beautifully. And I'm really, really happy with it. We've we've sent it off to a few uh, guitar players like John Petrucci and Steve Lukather, and uh, got some real nice reviews for those guys. So that felt good. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Yeah, it must have been uh, so important to have the right people to do that. Where, as you said, you said earlier, kind of all sensitive of each other's style and to not, not kind of, yeah, overplay or. Um... Yeah, and what I was kind of really impressive, you know, it feels like everyone's, it's not a everyone show off everything they can do at once. It's, you know, it's like everyone kind of has their moments and everyone's just kind of pulls in and out of what's um, what's needed to make the song work, I guess, as best as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's kind of funny, I guess, you know, if you're a solo guitar player, um, people will expect you to maybe uh, want to showboat all the time or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, Sometimes I feel really awkward, like in jam sessions, like uh, like people 
you know, like, hey, do it, go ahead, do your thing. And I'm just like, and here's a little pentatonic riff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that's never really been my strong suit, I guess, improvising anyway, you know, but uh, um, it, I, I, I just, I like music um, to say something, um, you know, whenever I hear it. I, I, I don't get off too much on long guitar solos and things. I, I think like, it's just me personally, but um, but I think there's a couple of ways of approaching music, you know, and, and um, like I think of myself more as like almost like an author, like I'm writing a story when I'm when I'm writing music or when I'm playing music, I want it to tell a story. I, uh, and so I, I, I kind of uh, have that mindset, I guess, about music. And so and so do, so do Callum and Trevor. So when we came together. Um, nobody had this feeling of like, yeah, let's, let's just tread on this song. Let's just, it was always more like, what can we add to tell this story, you know? Um, and so, yeah, picking the right guys, as you said, um, it was, was vital for that, um, the way we think about music and, and we have similar senses of humor and all that. So it just kind of all fit together perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I look forward to hearing the whole thing. Are you going to tour it um, at all or? Yeah, that's another reason why it, uh, the uh, the album's a little bit delayed is because we want it to come out and hit the road. And so uh, these days with booking shows, it's usually about six months ahead. You need to be uh, lining stuff up. So uh, that's that's what we'll be doing, though. We're going to hit the uh, hit the U.S. for sure on the coasts um, and uh, go from there, see what we can line up. Otherwise, you know, hopefully we can get over to the U.K. and Europe and um i've of course toured over there many times i used to play in in england sometimes twice a year i would come over early on 2008 2009 and 10 back in those days and uh, try to get over once a year uh, these days and hopefully can bring the guys with me and and uh, get over there to rock out some yeah yeah that sounds good i bet it'll be uh, a really fun talk uh yeah. yeah brilliant um so let's move into section two now Sharendous. this is where i ask my guests for a songwriting tip um, so what would your songwriting tip be for us today, Andy? Hmm, that is a good question. I guess, um, I guess, you know, when I, when I try to, to, to sit down to write something, I just try to keep an open mind as much as possible. Like, um, you know, like that's, that's part of the reason too, why I use the altered tunings. Um, it's just to try to feel like the, like leaving a channel open, like you can, discover things on the guitar um you know don't be afraid to move your fingers a bit see try something different and uh you know try new chords as too as well you know and, and uh uh like I, I i remember picking up a, a chord chemistry uh a book um i think it was his name was peter green i believe was the author um and just discovering new chords you know and, and trying those out and and hearing how do these notes like relate to each other in this chord, you know? Um, and then feeling a feeling from just a single chord, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, I think it's good to, to experiment and do, good to discover new things. Um, and then when you sit down to come up with a new piece and start writing, you'll have more to draw from. Uh, it's good to listen to a lot of different stuff as well. Uh, I, I started out listening to like Iron Maiden, like you know, one of my first records I got. Um, I saw Wasted Years on MTV when I was a kid, and instantly became an Iron Maiden fan. And uh, so, you know, I have a history of listening to a lot of hard rock and heavy metal and progressive rock. And uh, my mom, she got me interested in Earth, Wind, and Fire at a young age, and uh, Dad was into classic rock stuff. Um, so, you know, listening to a lot of different music can help help you find what it is you like about music maybe you like this aspect of funk music maybe you like this aspect of heavy metal and maybe you like this aspect of solo acoustic guitar music and you can kind of take all of those things and and start to discover yourself in a way you know uh, as an artist and, and musician um, so you can draw from all those inspirations and um, and the other thing i'd like to say too is when you sit down to write you know something new if it's not coming to you, it's not the end of the world, you know, maybe today is just not the day, you know, and your mind is thinking about the new dryer that you got to order because the last one broke and, the, you know, whatever. 
you got to make sure your kid's school lunchbox is filled <laughs> in the morning tomorrow and you know whatever it is you know it could be anything so um you know you can't you know get too discouraged if, if you can't come up with a tune today you just come back to it and maybe you'll just have an idea but make sure you get it down uh, i use my phone recorder I, I think a lot of people do to just you know make sure you get that little nugget of an idea that that sounds so good but you're not sure where to go with it but maybe you can come back tomorrow and you'll find something that works so um make sure you keep your ideas and and uh, don't get too discouraged if things don't come to you now and then but uh, there's always tomorrow yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah it's a good, a good few tips there. Uh, the first one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. really. Good. <laughs> um, what's your writing schedule like? Do you um, do you have like a routine where you go and you sit and you you work, or do you yeah you know, wait for inspiration? Man, or have... I got to admit, I'm probably one of the most undisciplined people on planet Earth. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> very, I'm very loosey goosey, but uh, I'm, I'm starting to try to work on it more. Uh, to really just, you know, say, okay, let's sit down and do some stuff here and see what happens. Because, yeah, I mean, I, it almost feels embarrassing, but I mean, I can sometimes go weeks without playing a guitar, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I, I felt really bad about that for a lot of years, but then I heard Michael Hedges did that too sometimes, and I thought, oh, it's okay then. Um, and for whatever reason, I can remember my tunes pretty well, you know, the pieces I've learned or created. Um, and... So like if I have a show coming up and I haven't played guitar in two weeks or something that I can still manage to go play a show. Okay. But, um, but uh, yeah, I, I need to get more disciplined about that. Um, and so really though, otherwise it's just kind of whenever uh, an idea comes, you know, sometimes I'll be doing something else entirely and I'll hear like a little musical idea and I'll come into the studio and, and see if I can find it on the guitar. Or sometimes I'll actually go to the piano first and uh, see if I can find it on there. Sometimes it's a little bit easier uh, to find things on there for me um, and just record those ideas so I have them down. Uh, but uh, I, am, I am desperately in need of a new album, actually, of solo guitar music. So this year I'm going to be working on that a lot and uh, get a new solo guitar album out as well. So I'll be so, yeah. locking myself away for several yeah. hours a day during the day to get that happening. <laughs> <laughs> and when you do, when you're doing a block like that, then would that be would that be how you do it? You just kind of yeah set yourself. I'm going to go and play for a while now, and then would it just be like I guess? Do you have anything in mind already of what you what you'd like to do with your your next set of solo stuff? I mean, I know you just said as a songwriting tip to be open minded to these things. So, um, but is there anything in your mind that like? A particular area you'd like to explore more or um yeah yeah absolutely um I've, I've actually got probably four or five tunes in development that are really kind of like retro 80s kind of sounding um i was born in 1979 and so i, I kind of discovered music in the 80s and mtv and uh and i just still love the sound of the 80s music and uh, and that's why I've done, you know, a handful of 80s arrangements for solo guitar, too. But, um, you know, incorporating synthesizer and electric guitar and things like that. Um, so, you know, we'll see. That might be a, just an EP thing that I release at some point. Um, but I think my next full album, I'd like to incorporate mostly acoustic guitar, but maybe some electric guitar as well. I've always enjoyed electric guitar, too. And, uh, you know, Eric Johnson and... Joe Satriani would probably be my biggest uh, influences on that. I uh, just really love their melodic sense, you know. Um, and so maybe incorporating some electric guitar solos here and there and see what happens. So that'd be the the angle, I think. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> sounds sounds great. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, I think it'd be cool. It'd be kind of something different. Nobody's really done that, I think. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would that be doing... Um doing some of the tapping and stuff on, I guess it's harder. You can't do the percussive stuff as clearly on electric. Is that right for the? Right. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd maybe something along those lines on an acoustic guitar, but then with an electric, maybe playing a, a melody on top, uh, nice. something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, a quick question that I imagine you probably get asked all the time, <laughs> but um yeah, some of our listeners uh, might not be familiar with uh, your style of music, but 
have you got any advice for people who are like, yeah, maybe we've seen one of your videos and think like that's just incredible and that you know they know a few chords, a few of the basic chords or the standard chords. Have you got any like a, a simple bit of advice of like what's the first a good first step for getting into um some of these more advanced technique guitar playing techniques? Yeah, sure. Um well I think it's wise to start with sort of traditional finger style guitar. Um, and that was really where I started. Um, one of the first tunes I learned uh, early on, my, my first guitar was a nylon string uh, acoustic guitar. And so, you know, I wanted to play Metallica and stuff like that, but it sounded kind of silly on there. So uh, I was like, well, what, what can I learn, you know, tunes that have acoustic guitar? And I started to learn things like Dust in the Wind by Kansas and uh, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You by Led Zeppelin and some of the other sort of finger pick tunes from Led Zeppelin. Uh, and, you know, a couple of tunes uh, in that era, sort of in the 90s, had some finger picking in them. There was a tune called Silent Lucidity by a band called Queensryche. Um, and so I, I just kind of started to learn, you know, some traditional finger picking tunes. Um, and then I had a cousin as well that was studying classical guitar, actually. Um, he's a really big Eddie Van Halen fan, but uh, he was studying a bit of classical guitar at the time and he had these Bach duets and he said, hey, you want to try and learn these with me? And I was like, sure. So, uh, you know, I started working on those with him as well, uh, playing finger style. And so anyway, I think uh, anyone that would like to get into, you know, playing without a pick and that includes traditional finger style or tapping and all that stuff. I think it's good to learn uh, something more traditional uh, where your thumb is maybe alternating between bass lines and you just have a pattern with your index fingers, uh, index, middle and ring fingers. And, you know, again, I guess maybe just to say again, dust in the wind, I think is a good one for anyone to start with just to get comfortable with using your right hand to, to pluck the strings. Hi, everyone. I'm Kath O'Neill. Back in May this year, I was diagnosed with grade four stomach cancer. I'd heard of the, the Swan Song Project on the Chris Evans radio show, so I contacted Ben about writing a song to inspire my 10-year-old grandson Rufus to improve his confidence. Working on the song gave me a distraction from my cancer, which was what I really needed. The process didn't take long, about half a dozen sessions online with Ben. He put the song together with some music uh, friends that he has, including Boff Whaley from Chumbawamba. The process was absolutely brilliant. I got so much fun from it. My family loved the song, including Rufus. Thanks for the memory, Ben. I'll never forget it. To help more people like Kath write their swan songs, please donate to the Swan Song Project today. Uh, brilliant. So uh, we're moving to section three now, Sherry. This is where I always ask my guests to share with us a song that's meaningful to them in some way relating to bereavement. Uh, and what I'll do here is I'll put the link to the song in the description of the episode. So if you're watching this, um, Andy will introduce the song in a moment. If you want to pause us and go and listen to the song, come back and have a chat about it, uh, you can do that. Uh, so which song have you chosen for us for this section, Andy? Well, I chose a tune uh, from Michael Hedges, and it's called When I Was Four. And this is uh, off of his album called Oracle. And I think as soon as your listeners hear it, they'll they'll feel it. And it's a very sort of nostalgic, somber sort of tune uh, with a lot of guitar and flute as as covering the the melody. So, yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful song. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if anybody's listening to this now and isn't familiar with it, you can pause it and go and have a listen to that and come back to it. Um, yeah, it's a very moving piece of music, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it's. I just, I, it's almost hard to listen to and not just kind of be stunned. I don't know if there's yeah. something about it. Uh, Michael was just such a, a brilliant uh, composer, really. And, and uh, you know, it's pieces like this or um, some of his other ones, like Ursa Major, uh, which we cover on the Triplicity album. Oh, uh, they don't, yeah, they don't, they don't necessarily have a, a real technically demanding component to them, but um but they're just unbelievably, like otherworldly, beautiful, you know. Um, and that was a good reminder to me. Like, you know, I, I I got really into the technical side of the guitar, of course, as a 
you know, young man that, you know, you're coming up and you've got your buddies all playing guitar. And it's like, well, I just learned how to play Eruption. And well, I just learned, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so you're kind of outdoing each other and you're, and you're testing yourself too. You're like, can I play this Yngwie Malmsteen like lick maybe? And then, you know, you get into the, like I got in the acoustic guitar and, you know, I heard Preston Reed and, and Don Ross and Michael. And, and it's like, oh man, I wonder if I can learn how to play these tunes and just get so, you know, energized by like oh wow i can i can learn these pieces but you know it's it's tunes like these that it was like oh my it was like a wake-up call it was like wait a minute this is like the real power of music like this changes everything when i hear it my whole world like is in a in a different mood now just because of this music you know and so that was like, yeah, this is what I need to focus on as a musician, you know, more than anything else is like, how can you help people in a way with the music, you know, maybe you can come up with something that helps people deal with bereavement, you know, um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of like why For My Father was written, or my tune Rai Lin as well, uh, dedicated to a friend when his daughter had passed away, so it's like, you know these are the emotions we can conjure up with with sound you know and maybe even help heal people a bit so that became like okay this is the objective <laughs> with music um and so yeah like when i hear this tune it's very uh powerful to me and it, you know maybe your your listeners will feel that way too it's just there's something very human and universal in there and it's that's the, the the real power of music is to remind us all that we suffer or we have joy um in our lives and and we we're all we're all not as different as we seem sometimes too you know we can all feel these things so um we can bring people together and you know help heal wounds with music so i think that's the power of that tune for me you know when i was four yeah oh, so <laughs> Yeah, that's beautiful, Andy. That's, um, I was going to ask something else, but that feels like a really nice point to end on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to, hard to go somewhere else after that. I yeah. Guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, that's been great. Um, Andy, really nice talking to you. I really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, thanks. It's been a fascinating episode. Um, and the new Triplicity album will be out in in the spring so i'll put all the links in the description as well so anybody listening to um the episode can can check out that and order copies of things like that um mm. and yeah just thank you very much for your time and i really appreciate it mm. thank you very much and yeah thanks for tuning in everyone i'll be back with another episode soon <laughs>